book that you've all read from, Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, 1861 to 65. And the way I'm going to get this conversation going is to pick up our little dialogue in there where you had said conversations you had over the last two summers with teachers changed the composition of this book. So if you can pick us up from there and let this group know why they matter, that would be great. Well, the last two summers, I did this. I was teaching high school teachers, grammar school teachers, uh, on Lincoln and Emancipation up in New York. And the first summer, I was busily writing the book, and the second one, I was finishing the book. I just finished it. And the first one was crucial because the, the teachers, after the week, toward the end of the week, would say, this is just too complicated. How am I going to teach? How am I going to get this down? And so I spent the second half of the week, me and my co-teacher said, figuring out how to, how to take a very complicated problem and present it in a way that teachers could teach it. And when I finished, it changed the way the book ended up being written because I realized that I wasn't presenting my argument in a way that could be simple and easy to understand. And the entire introduction was completely a product of my experience teaching folks like you. So it's another example of something Rich is familiar with, you're probably all familiar with, that you learn as much from the students as you do from the teacher. That was a great example of that kind of thing. This book, uh, if this book has any comments, it's largely due to the fact that I was forced to teach to teachers. That's great. That is absolutely great. So what we've decided uh, to do in terms of our course of action here is engage in a little Q&A, but I've asked you all to think about questions too. So I'm just going to ask uh, the first leading question or two, and then I'm going to invite you all to come in. Um, and It has to be the same question you put in your email, the first one. Which was? How did you come to write this book? Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, why don't, we, why don't we start there, and then I'll ask about Sumner's speech. And oh, this okay. is all about emails going back and forth through time, and I think you would ask me after we finally set, you know, we had three or four different dates because we were working with the Union League. And then after I was all done, I said, great, we got a date. And he wrote me this email and said, wait a minute, what am I talking about? <laughs> Which is often what happens. So thank you for reminding me. So let's talk about how you came to write the book first. Okay. And then we'll fast forward to the person who gave it the title, Charles Sumner. Um, a long time ago, too long ago, more than just a time ago, so long ago, it's scary. I published a, a very speculative essay called The Political Significance of Slave Resistance, in which I, I sort of suggested that uh, at the time, it was back in the 1980s when historians were dealing with this uh, very prominent scholar, a slave named Eugene Genovese, who sort of threw this question out to slavery historians at that time. That was my focus. Now, uh, all the historians were writing about slave resistance, the slaves, you know, they rebelled, but they also had day-to-day -day resistance and a variety of things like that. And Genovese throws this question out into the field and says, what, what significance does this stuff have? People always do this. Kids resist. Their parents. But you have to have a standard of political significance. right? So I tried to answer it. And I published this essay, as I said, a very speculative essay, called The Political Significance of Slave Resistance, which I focused on the role slaves played during the Civil War in propelling the process of emancipation. And at the time, I talked to my old dissertation advisor, and I said, I might want to do this you know, as a book to trace the connections between what's going on on the ground in the South during the Civil War and how emancipation policy is being formulated in the Lincoln administration. And he said to me, I don't think you're going to find much answers to that. So in a sense, this book is my answer 30 years later. And now my advisor has long since passed away, and he can't read my answer. Whether he can find it persuasive, I don't know. But uh, it started back then. I've been thinking about this problem, about the relationship between what's going on on the ground in the South, which was a subject that was just becoming you know, very fertile in the field of, of, of slavery and Civil War studies uh, during the Civil War, and what's going on in Washington. And what, what is the Lincoln administration doing? So it's way back then. It came back to life as a serious project in the course of writing my previous book, which was about uh, Abraham Lincoln, the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. That book 
originally was conceived to focus, and I suppose it still is, that the centerpiece, in some ways, the climax of that book, are these three meetings Lincoln, Lincoln and Douglas have. Right? And the thing that stuck in my mind as I was writing that book was the second meeting, which Lincoln calls Frederick Douglass to the White House in August of 1864. Lincoln is running for re-election. He thinks he's going to lose. And he calls Douglass to the White House and says, look, the slaves aren't coming to Union lines as rapidly as I had hoped. I may lose this election, and we need to get as many slaves off the plantations and freed as possible in case I lose. And, and Because if I lose and McClellan becomes president, emancipation stops. Right? And I, I thought, and, and Douglas says, well, the slaveholders have a lot of ways of keeping the news of the proclamation and the emancipation proclamation away from the slaveholders. So these two guys are agreeing that near the end of the war, slavery was still viable. And all of the scholarship that I was reading at the time, the Lincoln people were saying, you know, once Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, they was down, it was it was it was the death knell of slavery, and I'm thinking, well, then why is Lincoln saying this a year and a half later? And the social historians were writing things like, you know, by the time Lincoln finally got around to issuing the proclamation, no force on earth could have prevented this revolution from I'm thinking, well, why is Frederick Douglass saying this is the thing? So I intended to write a book explaining examining the question of why it took so long to get slavery abolished. And why, if it was a done deal, did they scramble so hard at the end of the war to get it So my original purpose was to write a book about how long it took. And I, that, as I said, that, that was the question coming out of my last book. I, I intended to start, I started doing the research, I spent a long time you know, uh, researching the Civil War and stuff like that, and I, I, I started where many books on emancipation start, which is Fortress Monroe, the beginning of the war, the first time slaves come to Union lines and aren't returned uh, in May of 1861. And that seemed okay, I didn't have too much to say that was different from what anybody else said, and, Except that there was this odd thing that there were all these newspaper reporters down there. I couldn't figure out why they were down there. And they're publishing articles like, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. I think I left that in the chat. I think, yeah. And it seemed a little odd to me that everybody was there waiting, as though they were waiting for this to happen. But and I let that go. And then I wanted to figure out, I, I, I figured I wouldn't have to do much research on the first Confiscation Act, which comes a couple of months later, because there were these two new books on it. Everybody, you know, but there was a problem with the books, and that was they all said, all the books said, the first confiscation, I couldn't do anything. So I thought, I thought, okay, I'm willing to believe they didn't do anything, but what did they think they were doing? And that's when I started reading the congressional debates from the special summer session of July of 1861, and I was stunned. I was stunned by the uniform commitment of Republicans in Congress in the first summer of the war, weeks after the war began, to start emancipating slaves, over and against the vehement objections of the Northern Democrats in Congress, the border state congressmen. They're fighting tremendously over this determination on the part of Republicans to begin emancipating slaves. That's when everything changed about the book. I started thinking, well, they can't possibly have just started talking this way. I went through the whole debate for the whole This can't just have popped up in July of 1861 and let me go back to the secession crisis, which I hadn't intended to cover. And the Republicans in Congress are quiet during the secession crisis. They're deliberately not saying anything, so the debates aren't so useful. So I just read all the newspaper editorials, and there it was. Everything they were saying in the summer was already already there in December and January of 1661. And then I thought, so I wrote up that chapter. And then I thought, well, this can't have just started in December of 1661. And I ended up, I just went backwards. The book, instead of going forward, started going backwards for me. And I ended up all the way back in, the, in your territory, in the late 18th century, and having to figure out where the language was coming from and what the premises of all these people were. So instead of writing a book 
that was only about how long it took, which the book is still about. It was also a book that basically said it's even longer. I ended up way back in the late 18th century tracing the origins of uh, emancipation. So that's how the book, that's how the book came into existence as an, as an intellectual problem. Along the way, uh, well, thank you. Uh, that's, that's great, Nettie. That, that helps me. I've learned a lot um, in the last five minutes alone, and I'm trying to work my way through everything you just said, uh, especially as it relates to my own work on Civil War emancipation. But let's, let's go back, not all the way to the 18th century. Let's go back to 1852, Freedom National, the rise of people like Charles Sumner, and this idea that the system now can become a bulwark of anti-slavery or abolitionist politics. Why is Sumner so important? Why is this speech, we're only reading half of it up to his exposition of an anti-slavery constitution. Why is this speech in 1852 so critical, and why does it give you the title for your book? That's the first time that's the first time you see, I see, the various elements of an anti-slavery argument that have been carefully constructed by all the way back at the end of the 18th century, and then the second wave, we get a conscious effort to construct a policy. This is the first time you see, I think, a national politician taking the concept of freedom national and throwing it out in public. and and. It's, I mean, the speech, as you know, is very specific in the sense that he's, he, it, it's the purpose of the speech is to advocate for the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. But I think, I mean, I, I think it's controversial. I think it has much broader implications than that. He's proposing as a justification for repealing it a broad anti-slavery philosophy that is tied to a very specific set of policies that are designed, in his mind, to put slavery on what Lincoln says, the course of ultimate extinction. That will basically denationalize slavery, withdraw all federal support from slavery, on the assumption that, that the Constitution only defends, wherever the Constitution is sovereign, there can only be freedom. Freedom has to be presupposed. Uh, freedom is the national policy, slavery is the local state policy. So, so slavery has no extraterritorial. So, so that speech perfectly encapsulates two things about Freedom National that I want to make clear. The one is that it's that it's a coherent anti-slavery philosophy, but it's tied to a very specific set of proposals, of policy proposals, things the federal government can do to promote the abolition of slavery. And that, I think, uh, that, I think, is the newer part of the book. If you go back and find arguments, of, you know, there are historians who recognize the importance of freedom national as a concept, but not so much as a set of policies, I think. And it's the policy stuff that ultimately, that's another thing about the book. It ended up being a policy book in a way that I hadn't expected it to be. And uh, 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 <coughs> one of the things that it occurred to me as along the way is that the history of the abolitionist movement is, is, for a very long time, has been written primarily in terms of the history of ideology, the history of ideas, right? And not policy. Uh, and as I reconstructed this argument, it, it began to occur to me that if you, don't, if you don't ask the question what they expect to do, you know, if William Lloyd Garrison says the Constitution is hopelessly pro-slavery, then what did he expect to do to get slavery abolished? Or what did anybody expect the federal government, if anything, to do to get slavery abolished? And it turned out that there was a policy history as well as a, an ideological history that needed to be told that seemed to be was missing from, from a lot of the historiography of the last generation. You know, this, uh, uh, the consequences, I think, there are some really big consequences that happen when you make that shift, I think. At least for the historiography of anti-slavery. 
Uh, and one of them is when you when you when you focus entirely on ideology or almost exclusively on, the, on ideology, and this has been a problem. I think uh, problem. It's been a tendency in the scholarship since the 1960s to sort of. Field is bedeviled by what I call the cult, what I call the cult of true radicalism. Right? Everybody wants to figure out who's the truest radical, who's the real radical, you know, and what does it mean to be a radical. And part of that is figuring out what it is that differentiates an abolitionist or an anti-slavery radical from a Republican. Right? And one of the things they uh, they come up with lists of things, you know. The, the, the thing that makes an abolition different is they're committed to racial equality. The thing that makes an abolition different is they're, they're for immediate rather than gradual abolition. That last one, that last one is a dangerous problem for me because once I reconstructed what Freedom National meant and where that idea, that agenda was coming from, that it's coming from radicals, it began to seem slippery to me to say that, you know, um, radicals favor immediate emancipation whereas uh, conservatives or, or Republicans or politicians favor gradual emancipation. That, that distinction didn't work for me anymore. And I should say that since, uh, even that book, even my book, it's, it's only gotten a year, so even that suffers, I think, from that problem. It is when I go back to the origins in chapter one, it's almost entirely about ideology. And since then, <coughs> I've been reconstructing the history of anti-slavery policy. And, and if, if I could demonstrate in the book that this agenda of gradually getting the slave states surrounded by a cordon of freedom so that slavery would deteriorate and die of its, of, at the hands of the states themselves, ultimately, is part of a radical agenda. I also have more recently come to the realization, it's put there in the book, but not that immediate uncompensated military emancipation is not a radical. That Lord Dunmore wasn't a radical. <laughs> and Lord Dunmore, if you I don't know if you did Lord Dunmore, but when uh, this is the first guy in November of 1775 who offers freedom to any rebel-owned slaves who come within his lines in Virginia and fight for the British during the American Revolution. The Revolution War was just getting started. He's, he's a high Tory, practically feudal type person. And the British ministry that's supporting this policy is not larded up with radicals. And uh, the people who defended that policy in the United States in the 1790s during the J. Treaty debates were people like Alexander Hamilton and James Hillhouse. And immediate uncompensated military emancipation is a mainstream argument, not a radical one. So in a sense, the, the focus on figuring out the difference, ideological difference between uh, uh, radical abolitionists and anti-slavery Republicans, when it pushed us in the direction of saying that immediate abolition is a radical program and gradual abolition is a mainstream idea, I think that's completely wrong. I think that gets it almost completely backward. Military emancipation is as ancient as ancient Greece. It's, it's defended almost uniformly in, in the United States from 1777 on. Um, uh, Edmund Randolph accepts it in the Secretary of State. And uh, James Monroe accepts it, James Madison accepts it. Nobody disputes that it's legitimate under the laws of war to emancipate slaves as a military necessity. Mm -hmm. Nobody. I can't find anybody doing it until you get to Jefferson Davis uh, and the Confederate, uh, Confederate Secretary of War saying there's a violation of the laws of war. So uh, I, military emancipation is, is even, well, even less than I realized at the time. Uh, not, it, it's always it, immediate, it's usually uncompensated. Almost always uncompensated, and uh, it's not a particularly radical program. It's not something you see on. It's not showing up, I think, in lists of things that the American Anti-Slavery Society is proposing. They're not imagining a war to me. Those people, like, like uh, 
Sumner himself come out of a peace movement. They're not, they're not going around saying, we're going to have a war, and then we're going to free slaves. That way. That's not, I don't think military emancipation is part of that in general. It's part of the anti-slavery movements in general. So, so it's when you shift to the policy that you begin to see the limits of, uh, of an approach to anti-slavery uh, that is strictly ideological. And the limits of an approach that is focused so intently on figuring out the difference between moderates and moderates. When what may be most historically significant, not that there aren't differences, but maybe what's most historically significant is what shared, as you put it in the the order might be more important than the differences. And the focus, I think it's fair to say, the focus has been on the differences mm -hmm. for the last 50 years. Absolutely. So I'm just trying to redress some of the imbalances that I see in the I just want to ask you a question sure. back to the title, uh, the subtitle rather, The Destruction of Slavery. It, to me, it does not convey the true victory that has been warning this emancipation. So do you think that word was sort of, it seems so mild for wow. such a, yeah. I was trying to use a, it, it does. I'm trying to use a non-mild word. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I, I'm just asking. Um, it, I think it, I did it because it, it conveyed. It, 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 it would be. It was hard. That's all I really wanted to say. It had to be destroyed. Uh, you had to. I mean, uh, uh, Rich can disagree with me on this. Maybe I don't know, but I think there is this creeping, pervasive what I call neo revisionism sweeping around sling around the profession that's saying uh, there's a, a book published two years ago by the guy who just served as president of the Southern Historical Association that said that, that slavery, the, the Civil War didn't accomplish anything that wouldn't have accomplished without it. Slavery was dying, it would have gone away anyway. And I use the word destruction because I wanted to say no. You had to drive a state through its heart. This thing was not going to go away. There was no, it had to be destroyed. It wasn't enough, you know, just to say, it, it, it wasn't going to go away. It wasn't going to gradually disappear. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's, just, and that, that or, or there is other stuff that this, you know, it wasn't worth it. I mean, you say this great achievement, mm -hmm. and I'm not, for all the horrors of African American life in the late 19th century, I still think emancipation was a, a major achievement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is disappearing from the scholarship. And I wanted to say this. You can't have a fight over whether or not African Americans should vote, whether, they, whether the children should go to segregated schools or integrated schools, or whether the wages should be equalized under slavery. There's no debate about whether, you, whether slave children go to segregated classrooms. You can't have that debate. You can't have a debate over voting rights for slaves, because nobody's going to have voting rights for slaves. Those are fights that presuppose emancipation. They are the fights that are possible because of emancipation, that are necessary because of emancipation. So I wanted destruction to indicate that it was something important, but also something different. Do you think that the policymakers had that same sentiment, that they had to destroy slavery? Because it seems as though by 1862, I think they realized it. But, but uh, you know, it took a while for them to come up with a, with a, with a, with a, a bill to, to, to emancipate the slaves. And, and it seems like even then they're kind of pussyfooting around. And they're almost treated like a hot potato. Cause no, I think they, I think, when you turn on the news and listen to somebody talk about how just privatize everything and the glories of the free market will solve everything. I think the Republicans, I think that if, if there's a, if there's an Achilles heel in Republican and anti-slavery, or, or, or it's it's not race. They're pretty good about race. It's really the naive assumptions about the glories of free labor, and free labor will just just free up the labor supply and everything. You know, and the system will fall apart. Pull the props out of this artificial system that can't really sustain itself economically, and slavery will just destroy. It will just go down the toilet right by itself. I think they were very naive about that. I don't think they were pussyfooting. I think they wanted to destroy slavery and they wanted it dead. I think they just didn't realize how powerful it was, how strong it was, how much how much it was sustaining the Confederate war effort. And, and they learned pretty quickly. I mean, you say it took a long time. Well, what's a long time? 
It was slated for 350 years. By the spring of the, the war starts in April of 61. By April of 1862, it's hard to find a Republican who doesn't realize that slavery is the stomach of the rebellion and needs to be completely destroyed. Is that a long time? In, in your in the chapter that we read, which one was that? It's a chapter four. Which was that? The Cordon of Freedom. Emancipation begins. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so much talk about um, Republicans who are saying we want to hold this union together, and if that means we have to abolish slavery, then we're willing to do that. But that wasn't their goal. Um, what do you think would have happened with slavery had the South not succeeded, and we did not start the Civil War at that time? That's tough. Um, I, I mean, I go back and forth on this. Another way of asking that question, and it's, it's like the $64,000 question. Another way of asking that question is, would the Cordon of Freedom have worked without a war? Could they have pulled it off? And that's, that's hard to say because one of the things that became very clear to me in writing this book is how quickly the policymakers adjusted to, the, to new situations. As they realize the inadequacy of the first Confiscation Act, they start passing more laws. And they, as, you know, they, they were determined to destroy slavery. They had to remain within the Constitution, but they thought this might get the ball rolling. It didn't. They pushed further. They pushed further. They pushed further. What would have happened had they, had they been able to start implementing the cordon around the South and realized that just closing it off in the territories wasn't going to do it. Just banning slavery on the high seas wasn't going to do it. Would how much would they keep adjusting their program, and how much would they? The real question is for me is would they have been able to? I mean, the, the argument made by the cooperationist slaveholders in the Upper South during the Session crisis is uh, all we have to do is stay inside the Union, and they're not going to have the majorities in Congress to do it. If they couldn't do it, they couldn't do it, right? If the Republicans never had enough power to be able to implement the Cordon of Freedom, then you know, slavery would have gone on forever. Right? Whether they could have done it had they gotten congressional majorities and continued, you know, one new slave state, one new free state at a time, get more and more power, I don't know. I can't say. My my gut feeling is that it wouldn't have worked. Or that it would have taken so long. But I really can't say for sure because of because they were pretty good at adjusting. I think, for example, it's not. I think they could have offered Delaware a gigantic financial incentive right, to just free, you know, thousand slaves, and send thereafter two new slave free state senators to Congress. And if they were able to do that, you know, a few times. Maryland, and keep any new slave states out of the Union. And with each new achievement, the power of the anti-slavery lobby block in Congress grows. I think they'd get more aggressive. They'd start saying things like, we're going to ban the interstate slave trade. That could really put a cramp on slavery. We can, we can tax the interstate slave trade. We can abolish slavery on all forts. In the South, in the slave states, in naval yards, and arsenals. I, I don't know how far they would have gone. My impression is they adjusted. So they, it's, it's easy for me to imagine that kind of scenario. It would have taken a long time. But then, you know, a lot of people died during the war. It's a pretty horrible, gruesome war. So whether it would have been worth it, I don't know. I don't know. I, they, I suppose the simple answer is I don't know whether it would work. But I can imagine scenarios in which it absolutely wouldn't have worked. I can imagine scenarios in which it just might. Well, with, um, when you mentioned emancipation, where they would pay the, the state taxes, mm -hmm. they offered that to, to a lot of the workers. Mm -hmm. so they offered to the they should have offered it earlier and more money? Or what, how would you have found it Oh, without a war? You know, the war radicalizes so many people, and it alienates so many people, and the, and the behavior of the army alienate some of you. It's hard to say. It's hard to say, you know, without a war, whether or not, I, I don't know. 
Delaware is a, is a frustrating state because I think like three times, two, at least two or three times between the Revolution and the Civil War, the legislature came within like a vote of abolishing slavery. And then it ends up being so resistant all through the Civil War to it. So it, it's hard to say. I'm not, uh, historians are very disdainful of compensation by and large. Oh, they can feel the concept. My feeling is get slavery abolished. Do what you have to do. You know, if you can do it without a war by paying them off, pay them off. Compensation doesn't matter. Um, when we just looked at Summer Speech for the first time, when I read it, it it reminds me a lot of Douglass's argument mm -hmm. and his embracing of the Constitution as a freeing document, as a national freedom document, and then using that in memory of black patriotism and all that stuff. Uh, since you wrote the book on Douglas and Lincoln, can yeah. you talk about his influence on northern politicians or any influence he might have had, or vice versa, how that flow of the information went? The thing I learned from that book on Lincoln and Douglas was that one of, the, one of the best ways of differentiating abolitionists among themselves is by looking at the way they thought about the Constitution. So there's, there's no, people commonly say that Garrison represents the radical wing of the, of the, of the anti-slavery movement, but I think Frederick Douglass is, and Garrett Smith, they're just as radical, and yet their view of the Constitution is diametrically opposed. So I, I don't think radical versus moderate is quite right, uh, but they're but to differentiate according to how they view the Constitution, I think that's right. One of the other things uh, uh, you would know this better than I do, but one of the things that's also become clear to me is that uh, the focus on that this this hunt for the true radicals, this, 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 you know. One story takes up the garrison and says, I'm for a garrison, he's the real radical, or somebody else says, it's the black abolitionists, they're the real radicals, or something like Jerry Smith or somebody like that. People take their subjects and they declare them to be the best. I say, they're all anti-slavery, good for them. But, but one of the things that I'm beginning to realize is that for all the, for all the, you know, you know, Radicals fight among themselves. They always do. They don't form themselves into these groups. But, but they're writing letters to one another. You know, they, they're in communication with one another. And they're watching what each other are doing. And it's, you know, they do understand at some basic level. Because for all the infighting within the movement over people who think the concept <coughs> is a pro-slavery diamond versus people like Frederick Douglass who come to conclude that it's an anti for all of that, they do understand that they are allies in a very important struggle, and that the struggle is pro-slavery and anti-slavery. That's the life and death struggle. And they maintain, if you read, if you read Chase, Chase, Simon Chase's letters, you know, he's writing off to Jared Smith, even though Jared Smith is advocating a very different interpretation of the Constitution, right? And nobody is, I mean, the, the squabbling between Douglas and Garrison is personal. Think. You know, it's a kind of sense of personal betrayal or something like that. But I don't think, I don't think it's disdain for. Well, there is some disdain for the, for the interpretation of the Constitution. But it's it's odd that Garrison is more disdainful of that view than Chase. You know, I, I don't know. I think I, I think you could. It's it's important as a, as a historian to understand these squabbles in the movement, but it's important also you know, to step outside and say, you know, it's the Democrats who are the problem, not that wing of the anti-slavery movement. I think, I, I think of more than I did when I wrote the book, I think that constitutional questions um, were at the heart of some of Douglas's resistance to the Lincoln administration. The Lincoln administration is taking a kind of centrist, mainstream, anti-slavery position that the Constitution is neither radically anti-slavery nor radically pro-slavery. And Douglas has gone to a different place and can't understand why the Constitution doesn't allow you 
right? Come on. If you believe the Constitution allows you to abolish slavery you know, the day you take office, then the, your failure to abolish slavery the day you take office is a failure. And, and Douglas pretty much comes to that conclusion by the 50s. That, that the Constitution is not in any way a pro-slavery document. I mean, it not only empowers every branch of the federal government, including the president, to summarily abolish slavery, but obliges, morally obliges, politicians. If you believe that, then yes, Lincoln was slow. <coughs> you discussed that immediate uncompensated emancipation through mil military emancipation right. was not considered a radical view throughout history. Yeah. And what, forgetting military, uh, military emancipation, but just a general emancipation proclamation, when would that have been considered? No, but not radical. Wouldn't that have been a normal view? Well, that's pretty huge. That's a that's radical. That's man man military emancipation taken to a radical extreme because because most military emancipations are specific. Most of the time you free a specific group of slaves for a specific purpose during a war, right? So starting in seventeen seventy eight, Rhode Island starts offering freedom to slaves who join the Continental Army. And Rhode Island is followed ultimately by New Hampshire and Massachusetts and New York and even Maryland, right? The Continental Congress in 1779 passes a resolution urging South Carolina and Georgia to emancipate 3,000 slaves in return for service in the Continental Army for the duration of the war. That's the way military emancipation usually works, right? Dunmore says, all slaves of rebel-owned masters who come within my lines and fight for the British Army for the duration of the war will be emancipated. So it tends to be, it tends to be circumscribed, military means. It's, it's a mainstream idea, but it tends to be circumscribed. What the Emancipation Proclamation reflects is the radicalization that the war works in the world and policy making. And you see this in the debates over the Second Confiscation Act where they're saying, to hell with these limited approaches. The, pro the proclamation says all slaves in all areas in rebellion are hereby emancipated. That's, that's huge. That's really huge compared to previous military emancipations. So when you discuss the object or purpose of the war versus the means, where the Republicans in Congress in 61, their object was to save the Union, and if that meant about that meant abolition of slavery, so be it. You, you already have most Republicans in Congress were still opposed to a general, in the heart of arts, a general emancipation? I wouldn't say they were opposed to it, just didn't, it wasn't, wasn't feasible. It wasn't there yet. They weren't there yet. I don't think they were opposed to the idea. Just, you know, this is what they, they have to start with the usual way that military emancipation happens. If you look at the first set of orders, when I, the emancipation begins, right? August 8th, 1861. That, that policy is Dunmore's policy. That's, that is, all slaves coming within Union lines are emancipated, but you can't go onto a plantation and, and do it. That's, that's typical of the way military emancipations work. Now, when I say the purpose or object of the war is the restoration of the Union, it's always the purpose and object of the war. They can never stop saying that. The Constitution protects slavery in the states where it already exists. The purpose and object of the war can never be the overthrow of slavery. Never. Ever. He advocates the 13th Amendment in, the four, in his last annual message to Congress in December of 1864. He says, the purpose of the object of, the, of this war is what it always was, the restoration of the Union. Slavery is the cause of this war. I therefore urge Congress to pass the 13th Amendment. He never changes his mind about what the purpose or object of the war is because the Democrats are constantly on their tails saying, you know, you see, we told you, we told you, the purpose of this war is really to abolish slavery, you're just a bunch of radical things. And they're always saying, no, 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 the purpose of this war is always what we always said. It's, it's, the purpose is always just to restore the union. We don't have the constitutional authority to go to war for the purpose of abolishing slavery. We have the power to abolish slavery under the laws of the war 
as if that's what we think it takes to get it done. So uh, along those lines, then, the, 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 this idea of purpose versus, you know, talk a lot about the, if, 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 and, and the idea that you know, people being, okay, if slavery ends, that's fine, but we need to be fighting to be, keep the union together. I didn't say that. They hate slavery. And, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good reasons for thinking that, I mean, the Democrats are saying it isn't a military necessity. We don't need to free slaves to end the war. They're, they're inclined to think that it was. And therefore, you know, they're, they're inclined to say we have to emancipate in order to free, end the war. Now, is it plausible to say for Lincoln to go before Congress in December of 1864, right? Atlanta has been burned. Sherman's on his way to Savannah, right? Burning his way through Georgia. Grant is months away from blowing Lee out of Petersburg. Everybody knows the war is about to end. The last of the of the major ports among the Confederates has been closed off. Everybody knows the war is about to end. Is it plausible for Lincoln to say we need to pass the Thirteenth Amendment in order to end the war? That's what he says, but it's not plausible. I don't think it's plausible. He knew the war would end without them having to abolish slavery. He couldn't say. Why does he? Why does he want it done in January of 1865 instead of waiting till July for another special session? Because by July the war is over. He hasn't got an excuse. Right? He hasn't got the war as an excuse. There's something to the Democratic complaint that Republicans are using war as an excuse. To, to go after slavery. Not, not, it's not completely true, because there is truth to the argument that you know, slaves are a responsible There is something to the argument that the are willing to push a lot further to get slaves involved. Does that answer your question? I, I, I just wanted to, um, the, the fear of, you know, I, I know the, the Democrats uh, are accusing them of, uh, of of being too radical. Is is the fear of stating a purpose? Is uh, of, of a purpose of war being being slavery? Is is that is that all is that at all connected to what we see in modern days of you know wanting to be reelected? The the fear that that they're going to go back to whatever district you're going to see them as being too radical, or is it mostly? Is it more based on, what, um, on just this isn't in the Constitution? Uh, I think, you know, the anti-slavery people, partly because of garrison maybe, but, but the anti-slavery people are, are always <coughs> accused of being disunionists. And not until session does that really transfer off of them, just the odor of disunionism. They're, as a result, they come into the war with 30 years of experience saying, look, we are not going to step outside the bounds of the Constitution. We absolutely will not do it. You know, they're, they're accustomed to being accused of trampling the Constitution, and they're, it's been, and they're therefore accustomed to being very, very careful to, to say that they're not. That they're, they believe they can get slavery abolished within the Constitution. But they're not going to say, to hell with the Constitution. We want to abolish slavery. I don't think the, uh, I, I, I don't think saying that the purpose of the war is the restoration of the Union means they don't think the war was caused by slavery. They all think the war was caused by slavery. And they all think that emancipation is a legitimate means of fighting the war. But in that sense, I think, I think it's a completely artificial distinction to say that it's one or the other. They don't think in those terms. Historians think in those terms. Those people didn't. Thank you. Um, on page 136, you talk about, uh, towards the um, bottom of that page, that Republicans agree that the states have seceded from the Union and incorporated the Constitution's protection and entered a state, into a state of war. And I was thinking about that, and I was wondering, if they forfeited, I, I always, was under the interpretation, and this may be wrong, that Lincoln viewed those states as being part of the Union even though they had their own government that was, um, you know, that they were part of the, 
of sovereign government. Um, if that was the case, if they were truly part of the union and he was preserving that union and not acknowledging that they were now a separate government, then didn't the rights of property under the Constitution allow for those slaves to not be emancipated? Um, it, it, I, I almost am taking the perspective that if you agree that these states were in fact seceded, that then you could emancipate the states, the, the slaves, um, because it was the act of war. Does that uh, if they're in a state of rebellion, all it has to do is be in a state of rebellion. In rebellion so all the federal government has to do is to justify a military emancipation to, to go into the slave states with the U.S. Army and to, in order to suppress the rebellion. War powers get invoked for the suppression of the rebellion. And so it doesn't matter think, whether they were in or out. Yeah, the question of in or out of the Union is, is, is almost academic. I don't think there's any, any, I don't think there's a Republican position on that. I think they're, they're all over the place, all during the war, and they're in or out of the Union. But everybody knows they're in a state of rebellion. rebellion. Everybody knows that it's a war to suppress the rebellion. Thank you. And therefore, the, uh, this is the crucial, one of the crucial precedents that I've just come to realize for this seminal war in the 1830s. Then you get, you get these, these Union commanding officers on the ground in Florida writing back to their superiors saying, this isn't an Indian war, this is a Negro war. All these facts have run into Florida and are the strongest allies. They're pushing through this war because they're not just fighting to keep from being moved to the West. They're, because they're fighting to prevent their own re-enslavement. Right? And, and they realize that in order to stop this war, to get these Seminoles subordinated, they have to figure out some way of separating that group of free slaves, of self-emancipated slaves, or runaways, like whatever you want to call them. Blacks living in Florida as free, uh, they have to separate them off. And the way they ultimately do it is by offering them freedom. They have hundreds of slaves freedom. Slaveholders have a fit. They have a fit. And they won't back down. They tried to back down, and the war started up again. And ultimately, they had no choice. It goes to court. It actually goes to court in Louisiana. And the general, the commanding officer, the military commander of the district, has to go to court and justify the emancipation of the slaves under the laws of war. And all the arguments he uses in the courtroom in New Orleans in 1839 are the ones that you're going to hear coming out of the mouth of General Benjamin Butler and Congress during the Civil War. We, you know, the, the, it's not just the men, it's the women and the children. They're also working to support, and when they're feeding and clothing the the, you know, the enemy, then they're stating they're going, therefore we can militarily emancipate, justify military emancipation. All of it, they're suppressing, and, and this is what Adam says on the floor of Congress. What's going on in Florida is partly an Indian war, but it's a servile insurrection, and, 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 and the federal government has the power to emancipate slaves in order to suppress a servile insurrection. It's the Seminole War that is causing him to say those famous things that become crucial to people like Sumner. Thank you. Maggie? So um, I was interested in your discussion about the shift in historiography from discussions of slate of agency among African Americans to this other discussion. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the essay that you mentioned, the political significance of slave resistance, because when I teach my students, I really focus a lot on agency and resistance, because honestly, that's the part of the historical narrative that African Americans ourselves have. So I want to know how that's being addressed in, I guess, the more official Scholarly historiography. Oh, I actually think that, that that's a. Uh, there are some Lincoln scholars who think Lincoln freed the slaves to the start of his pen, but, mm -hmm. but the dominant tendency has been to focus on agency. And I, I feel like I'm in that. You know, I've always felt myself to be in that historiography. Mm -hmm. The only difference here in this book is that I'm saying the Republicans knew that that all of their anti-slavery policies presupposed that once they opened Southern, the open Union camps in the South to runaway slaves and emancipate them, that the slaves would start running. Otherwise, it's not going to work, because until the Emancipation Proclamation, the policy is not to entice slaves from their plantations. It's only going to work if the slaves run. And they run in huge numbers, and they, and in so doing, so the so the policy presupposes agency, right? 
It presupposes, and there's a, a debate about this during the secession crisis, mm -hmm. right? That, uh, I think, is it in that chapter? Mm -hmm. What are the slaves going to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the Republicans take one position, and the Democrats say, no, 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 they're content, they're not going to do anything. So they feel vindicated, mm -hmm. which it turns out is why there's all those reporters. Because mm -hmm. it's a fight, and they want to see who's vindicated, right? And the Republicans feel vindicated. But they also begin to realize that they had been naive about the strength of unionism in the southern states, and that when soldiers, northern soldiers, go into the southern states, the, the blacks are the only loyal people they find. And suddenly, it's not just the agency. It's the agency attached to their loyalty to the union that, that reinforces the sense and pushes the policy still further, because by late 1860, early 1861, early 1862, what Republicans uh, in the administration and in Congress are saying is that emancipation isn't just a, a military necessity, it's a reward for loyalty. These are the only loyal people our soldiers find when we go into the slave states. And we have as much an obligation to protect them as we do to suppress the disloyal. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think at every step of the way, agency is crucial to the way Republicans are formulating their policies. That's the difference between where I was 30 years ago. Now, that is to say, in a sense, I found what I thought I would, what I hoped to find. I didn't find it where I thought I'd find it, and it didn't look like what I imagined it might be. I don't know what I was doing. But it's there. Uh, so in this seminar, as we've been learning about the abolitionist movement and the long history, it seems like a kind of consistent obstacle um, to abolitionism is a, a lack of uh, acceptance of the prospect of living in a biracial society. Uh, your Republicans seem to have emancipation as a goal, if not purpose, of the war, um, and seem to be welcoming it. Now, if they're going to advocate for emancipation, it seems to me that they either have to envision living in a biracial republic or have to accept kind of coercive colonization. Um, so how far back are your Republicans prepared to live in a biracial society? From their founding? When do, when do you think that acceptance of a biracial America becomes, um, a kind of, reaches a critical mass? amongst Republicans or the folks that become Republicans? Because I don't think it exists in 1776. When? I actually think there's more of it in 1776 than you think. Yeah? Yeah, I think it goes this way. Okay. I think, my impression is that the, the first generation of abolitionists, the ones who fought to get abolished in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, did envision a population society and were shocked after the War of 1812 by the emergence of the American Colonization Society. Um, I think. And then it, it goes into a trough and, and it, it diminishes uh, starting in the 1840s. That, that, that. I think that um, what Eric Foner says about Lincoln, I would also s extend to most Republicans. I don't, race is our obsession, it wasn't theirs. I don't think they thought too much about that question to the extent that they did. They weren't so bad. I mean, I think this, you know, you, I slammed you with this, slammed you with this. But, but I, I think there's a tendency to talk about race the way consensus historians used to talk about American values, right? That, that there's this, gigantic thing called racism that's sitting there, never changes, all whites, you can presuppose that all white people are racist all the time, and it doesn't really change, and nothing can change, right? Whereas I think there's fighting, and that the Republicans on that issue, they're not, I wish they were, but they're okay. That is, they do imagine, for example, here's a question. It, it, it tears American politics apart in the 1850s. 
And it's about racial equality. It's not about slavery. It's caused by the debate about slavery, but it's not a debate about slavery. Does the promise of fundamental human equality in the Declaration of Independence apply to blacks and whites? What do Republicans say? They say yes. They say yes. They all say yes. It does. Right? They almost all say yes. And that's what the Lincoln Douglas debates are about. Stephen Douglas is saying no, it doesn't. They didn't mean it. They meant white people. When Jefferson wrote that, he meant white people. And Lincoln is saying, no, he didn't. He didn't mean that. And he's, he's very clear and pointed about it. He says, if Stephen Douglas says, thinks that the Declaration of Independence applies only to white people, then he should say it. He should come right out and say, all men are created equal except black people. That's what he says. Because I don't believe it. And he's not the only one who's saying that. Here's another question. But stay right there for a minute, Jim. I, I think this is really important, and I think this gets back to some of our debate. Um, and I'll only mention that I think there can be a legitimate disagreement, but it's funny, I think you, you totally did slam me, and I didn't realize that I had gotten under your skin at a conference where I said, I think your picture of these Republican liberators, partly for the reasons that Ben outlines, is a little rosy, and I just thought it was an off comment, I was trying to find words, and then a couple months later in an email, you said, my Interpretation still a little too rosy for you. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that really stuck, stuck in your. I didn't actually know what you meant because I didn't follow up in my answer. Right. I wasn't sure whether you thought, <laughs> whether you were talking like Jim Downs, that emancipation is a vicious violent right, process right. and it results in a horrible thing, or whether you were saying my view of the Republicans was too rosy. That and, and <laughs> the processes through. Right. the destruction of slavery. And so this right. is why I think it's important to stay here for just a minute. Yeah. Because I think, in a weird way, you're changing the definition of the game that you set out, where before you said it's not about ideology, it's policy. You've got to look at the policy makers and how they destroy slavery. And then when we talk about were Republicans ready for a biracial republic, you go back to ideology. But if you look at policy, very early on in the Civil War, Republicans are not willing to come out and state claims to grand equality on the ground. And that's part of the debate in the North. Will this mean equal schools? Will this mean equal access to everything? Lincoln himself says, you get the Declaration of Independence to get your wages. That doesn't mean I have to eat with you. That's right. That doesn't mean you go to the school where my kids go. That's right. And so I think I, this is I, something that the war produces that I would say is worthy of more discussion. Is emancipation simply about freedom national, or is it about equality national school? And that's where I think you start to see the Republicans slide apart. And I was just reading Garrison this morning in the middle of the war where he says, you know, I'm in touch with these Republicans. You're right, he's writing to them all, even if he disagrees with them. And he says, you stop the war now, half of them will take what they can get and deal with the rest of it later. And he's just talking about slavery. He's not even willing to concede that Republicans are about egalitarianism on the ground. So if you talk about policy, yeah. In terms I can of do that. that. I can do that. How would you? I can do that. <laughs> um, I'm starting with the question of whether there is a racial consensus and whether there is such a thing as what I call racial consensus history. And you see it everywhere. You see how come it took them so long? Well, the priest opposition did take them long, which is what I said to the reference, right? Right. You invoke race to explain something that doesn't need explaining to me. Right? Why did it take them so long? Didn't take them so long. They started right away. So, but it's it's framed as an ideological consensus. Racism is rampant north and south. All Americans are racist. So I'm trying to say, let's differentiate here, right? There are some issues on which there is real disagreement about race, and the policy consequences of saying the the Declaration of Independence applies to blacks as well as whites are massive, because one results in an anti-slavery policy and one doesn't. And that, that's a policy that has direct implications for the lives of millions and millions of African Americans. So there's a policy question directly related to this difference about race, right? Yes, they do not say that, that schools, marriages, juries, voting rights should be equal. Absolutely right, absolutely right. This is not something Republicans advocate. They do advocate fundamental equality of natural rights. They also advocate equal citizenship. They're 
pushing that by late 1862. That's right. So, and I think there are, that's part of anti-slavery politics also. They're not going into this third area that Lincoln defines as, as you know, local majorities in the states make these decisions about whether or not blacks can serve on jury, whether or not blacks, and he's willing to defer to the racism of local majorities on those questions. I absolutely agree with you on that. Absolutely agree. But that's different. If you keep on focusing on that, on the areas of agreement, that's, you're going to miss the degree to which, in the 1850s, what was so controversial about Lincoln's views on race was not the stuff where he agreed with, with white racists, but the stuff where he departed. That's why he kept getting called a black Republican. I just want to just say, just don't smother everything under this rubric of racial consensus history. Break it out, because they're fighting about race. They're fighting about black citizenship. They're fighting about whether the Declaration of Independence. There's a huge fight about race in the middle of the 18th century, of the 19th century, and it has direct consequences policy consequences for the lives of millions of African Americans. Mm -hmm. Other, I mean, we've got lots of hands up, so I wonder if there's any more new voices in on this. We've got Tulani, Kalisha. Um, one of the ways I teach at um, this period, uh, pre-Bellum, and post bellum whatever, um, is Republicans as reactionaries to Southern overreach. Mm -hmm. and so southern, southern, as reactionaries to Southern overreach and just over the top racism, right. over the top racism, right. uh, where they where like they're forced, their hand is forced by, by, you know whether it's yeah, right. 1850, 1866, right. 1867, right. or whatever. Uh, can you correct me if I'm wrong, or just maybe address the, them as reactionaries to the overreach? Well, I, I would say reactionaries. I think the Southerners are reactionaries. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. In, in, in policy and through in ideological terms, but but um, yes, but I, I think that works both ways. I mean. Secession is a reaction to Lincoln's election, right? They're reacting to one another all along the way, right? So, so, uh, you start in the late 1820s and early 1830s getting this push among anti-slavery people for the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C., right? And you start to see a reaction among Southerners on the floor of Congress making the argument that, that the federal government has no power to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C., and starting to make a constitutional argument, in response to which the abolitionists start developing very sophisticated constitutional arguments for why Congress does have the power to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C., and it's back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until both sides are radicalized in the process, and you end up in 1860 with what I consider an irreconcilable conflict. So they're there. It's, it's dialectical, not just uh, Republicans reacting to pro-slavery. For example, in the 1830s, you know, uh, most slaveholders, most big slaveholders are Whigs. And Whigs accept that sometimes the government has to take your property for purposes, you know. They're modernizers and they think the state is good, you know, can take, they, you should build railroads and should build canals and should do all these things. And they don't have an absolutist conception of property rights. The only people in the 1830s in Congress who are saying that, that slave property is indistinguishable from all other property and that the right is absolute are John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis. By 1860, all Southerners are saying that. All Southerners are saying that. There's nothing left of that old wing. Stuff. So the argument becomes more extreme, more absolutist over the course of these debates, things like that. So the pro-slavery argument and the anti-slavery argument are becoming radicalized, I think. And the way David Potter put it was, that, you know, the center falls out of American politics in the 1850s, and the middle ground positions, like restoration of the Missouri Compromise, or, or uh, uh, what's the, the Stephen Douglas one, popular sovereignty, they disappear as viable alternatives by 1860, all you've got is two extremes left. Um, just a quick question. How historically accurate was the movie Lincoln? Mm -hmm. that came out for some purposes, I suppose, for, for me, it was just too Lincoln oriented. I mean, it was too Lincoln oriented, but it was not Lincoln oriented. Um, It was, 
it made Lincoln so much the center. You know, he, he made it look it made it look as though the Congress, the Republicans in Congress were a bunch of you know, dysfunctional, disorganized you know, cats that had to be herded. And Lincoln has to pull Thaddeus Stevens into a basement kitchen and you know, talk to show him or teach him about what the middle ground is and you get to true north by going around the swamp and so like that. Well, you know, Thaddeus Stevens didn't need that lecture. He knew. He knew how to work Congress. He knew how to get things through Congress. And, and, and the Thirteenth Amendment wasn't Lincoln's idea. It came out of Congress. And by the time he jumps into it, you know, it's fairly late in the game. And there's no question that he moves heaven and earth. He does a lot of the stuff that's in the movie in order to get it through. But it, it wasn't his idea originally. And, and I think that uh, I don't know, the war power speech he gives is also, it's also creepy to me because there is an argument about war powers that's going on all during the war. The first speech about the war powers and emancipation comes from Thaddeus Stevens in July of 61, justifying the first confiscation of it. And he's answering Democrats who are saying already that Lincoln is behaving like a tyrant, that he's doing anything he wants, he's trampling the Constitution, he's using war powers to justify anything, you can do anything you want. And Stevens says, no, 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 the war powers are shared. Congress has some power, and the President has some power. And the President can only exercise the war powers we give him. So we say which slaves can be confiscated, and the president then has responsibility to finish the job by emancipating the slaves we declare to have been forfeited, right? That's the classic example. Okay? So that we're protected from the danger of military dictatorship by the fact, by the separation of powers, right? The president can't do it. Well, he's got Lincoln in the movie saying, I'm the president, I have war powers, I can do anything I damn well please, right? Maybe it was illegal, but I'm the president. I, it sounded like Dick Cheney. It sounded <laughs> like the unitary executive. And it's the, uh, and you know, I, the flip side of this is when historians demand that, you know, why didn't Lincoln free the slaves the day he became officer? Well, you think Lincoln could do anything he wanted? You think you like that? You sound like Dick Cheney to me too? <laughs> You know, I, I just don't understand this notion that the president can do anything he damn well pleases whenever he damn well pleases it. It's, it's a late 20th century imperial presidency imposition onto the middle of the 19th century. And that, that's my real big problem. With the it just, it just, it, it, without real, I'm all for politics, you know, but not that kind of thing. Not that kind of thing. Now, towards the end, there was the, the part where some of the Republicans who were for the abolition of slavery also felt that blacks were equal with whites and they had to let go of that idea yeah, of that's equality. Not, that's, yeah. that's not accurate. Yeah, the, the, the radical position that that is the mistakes is the position he takes in the movie. Right? Equal, equal justice under law. There are a couple of people, like Charles Sumner, who are pushing further you know, about private discrimination yeah, and those kinds of things. But the it's radical it's position on race that Thaddeus Stevens represents in the middle of the 19th century is equal justice under law, right? which the movie presents as a compromise position, as an atoning down. That also, I think, is historically important. I should also say, you know, uh, 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 something you said, I, I really do think that the war does radicalize Lincoln and the Republicans on racial questions. I really do think that that's the case. I think, you know, I think by late 1865, by late 1864, Lincoln is contemplating things that he never contemplated, you know, like black voting rights. And, and, I, and I, I think this is where I, I think Fulman was absolutely right, is that just as it, it was impossible to, do, to debate about slavery without debating about race, because slavery in the United States and the New World is racial slavery. And, and, and you can't debate them without, you can't debate one without the other one cropping up. Right? Much as they didn't want to talk about race, they had to. Um, and I think they couldn't confront emancipation, couldn't confront the question of 
I don't think they thought too much about what a biracial society is going to look like. A lot of them, for example, like Chase. You know, a lot of them believe that um, black people were brought here against their will to a, a, a climate that is incompatible with their genetic makeup, and that they were forced here, and that once they're free to go about their business as they choose, the races will naturally separate. Whiter people will gravitate to the northern climates, and darker skinned people will gravitate to them. And the problem will take care of itself. It's weird. They have all sorts of weird racial views in the middle of the 19th century that, that are different from what we are, what we have. So uh, I, I, I don't think hardly any Republicans believed in deportation. No. No, hardly any. Colonization is, the slaveholders don't want colonization. The Democrats don't want colonization. The other people who talk about colonization are people who talk about emancipation. And, so, and not all the people who talk about emancipation talk about colonization. Here's the thing about complicated policy, right? Here's the thing about colonization, though. There's a lot of talk about colonization and scholarship these days. Not as of the four million slaves who were emancipated during the Civil War, how many were deported from the United States in the wake of emancipation? Zero. Where's the policy? Where's, there is no policy. People say, it's just ideology. No, no, no. <laughs> I think this, no is, this is, I think this is what is so fascinating about this, this debate. And um, I mean, this is a formidable book that I'm trying to um, overcome as much as understand because my national history of emancipation is somewhat different from yours but I think in a similar way to the way that you read our looking back on race with 21st century race, I think we're reading uh, 1865 into 63 into 61 when we talk in these ways right about about colonization emancipation the war changes everything and it's not just a talking point this is a revolution. This is something that blows people's understanding of body, society, constitutions apart, right? That before the Civil War, there's the sense that the American Constitution is the American body. It's fixed. You can't change it. It's as great as it's going to get. And only in wartime, when people start dying, do people really take seriously the, the idea that you can start playing with it. So to look at someone like Lincoln or Seward or Chase in 65 and say, see, they never really thought about these things in coercive terms, I think is wrong. In 61, 62, Lincoln sees how explosive even, forgetting about first confiscation, even contraband is in the North, right? Northerners want nothing to do with hordes of what they consider savage blacks all coming up their way. The Th this is the language they use, right? All Northerners all the time. No, no, no. This is something that is fundamentally though, shaping, I think, Lincoln's conservatism early. So that when he says this is what the war is about, he's not just saying this constitutionally, he's saying, don't worry, in the North, we're not going to do Haiti, British emancipation. And only once the war continues and shatters any preconceptions he has does he start to strip away these ideas, like colonization, like a monoculture. And I think, in a way, the war saves him. I, I think the evidence. war absolutely saves Lincoln. I want some evidence. I want you to show me that uh -oh. Lincoln was somehow <laughs> inhibited, <laughs> inhibited in his emancipation by his racial attitude. Well, you're asking me to prove a negative. No. What I would say is, if Confederate at any the way that I would look at any of these issues is mm -hmm. stop the Civil War at any point that we're talking about 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. So let's say, just to choose a random example, October 1st, 1862, five Confederate states come back into the Union. They accept Lincoln's terms. We're coming back. Colonization is already sort of out there as a lingua franca. I don't think Lincoln looks at the Union slavery or emancipation in the same way that he will five months later. Because he is absolutely convinced that union comes before emancipation. They're not working together. And that's why he holds that out there. Hold what out there? Emancipation, if you don't come back in by January 1, 63. 
if you come back before the preliminary emancipation proclamation, as we will see, says, you know, you have this many days. If you don't come back in, now enslaved people are free. I don't, That's not what he says. What does he say? He says, you can come back in on the terms of the gradual abolition. He doesn't say that. What does he say that? Preliminary proclamation. He does not say that. Yes, he does. What does he say? This is, this is. Someone bring it up. He does not say that if you come back in, you have to agree to gradual emancipation. That's not a condition of reunion pre-January 1st. Except this offer. This offer is on the table. That's a carrot. That's not a, but that's not the terms of the emancipate, the preliminary emancipation. But emancipation, right? fine, but the emancipation isn't abolition anyway. He never, I doesn't have to say anyway. But if he... I, look, I'm not disagreeing with you that, I, I absolutely agree, and I think this book... And I know what historians do, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree <laughs> that the war changes everything, and that every month, Everybody's in a different place, or at least every three months. That they're, that they're constantly changing. Where the Republicans are in 62, early 62, is not where they are in early 61 and, and, and 63. I, I absolutely agree with that. But I don't think, uh, I, I'm just resistant to the notion that you can pull racial attitudes out of the air and impose them on people without having any evidence that that's what they're justifying. That's why they're doing what they do. Or why they're failing to do what you presume they should have done or would have done had they not had the advantage. But I didn't do that. I said that Lincoln's words are, if you come back into the Union no, before prior this date, right, then you get to hold on to slavery. Emancipation may or may not occur. We're going to give you a carrot to try to buy right. slavery from your midst. And he's already met with black leaders saying colonization has to be on the table. And I would say from that moment till the next moment of decisive change, January 1, 63, Lincoln sees more destruction, takes colonization off the table. But I am not one of those scholars that would argue Lincoln's just using that as a chess piece. He, Who says that? I would say that's what? That's the hidden Lincoln, right? The, the gamesmanship Lincoln? That Lincoln is not really a colonizationist at heart? Who says that? Oh, there's a whole series of historians who say that. There's a couple. Can we name five? Oh, man. Stop I mean, the email, email, it. email it later. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll open this up to the floor again. You can see what we're, what we're it's doing. It's not that. I mean, again, we're at an, it's not an either or choice. There's and we say this with love. I mean, you understand this, There's right? a gamesmanship going on in that meeting. I don't right. think it's, I, it seemed obvious to me that there's gamesmanship going on in that meeting. That doesn't mean he doesn't seriously believe that colonization is the best is the best thing for everybody. I think he believes it, and there's gamesmanship, you know, going on. So I don't think it's true. I don't think the fact that he believes it is proof it's that it wasn't right. gamesmanship, and I don't think the fact that it's gamesmanship means it's not sincere. I, I think that he's. I think his commitment to colonization bulges. Mm -hmm. In 62. There is no colonization in the Delaware proposal. He drafts two laws, two, two different gradual abolition proposals for the state of Delaware in November of 1861, sends them out. The Del in the Delaware legislature, it never gets to the floor debate, but the Democrats in the legislature start denouncing it for, among other reasons, the absence of a, of a colonization proposal. And he, he realizes it's flopping there. He's going to go public in March, March 6, 1862. The day before, he shows the speech to his postmaster general, the arch colonizationist, Montgomery Blair, from in, in the cabinet. Blair comes to him on the 5th and says, you've got to put colonization in there. You've got to put colonization in there. And he doesn't. He doesn't. It's not there. It's not in the proposal. It's not in the inaugural address. It's not in the December the November proposals, it's not in the March 6th address, it's here, it's not here, it's here, it's not here. We don't have somebody who's acting obsessed with colonization. We have an erratic, you know, here it's, here it is, and then there it's not. You know, it's not in the Emancipation Proclamation, it's not, you know, it's not in the 13th Amendment, it's, and, and it never happens. It's an awful lot of ink spilled about something that never happens. 
it seems to me that in the context, I see this in the book, in the context of what tends to happen and what happens in the United States to Indians, it's fairly remarkable that it didn't happen. The largest number of, of former of slaves colonized outside the United States after the Civil War were the slaves carried off to Cuba and Brazil by their slave, by their owners to get them the hell out. No slaves, no slaves were forced deported from the United States. But I don't think that shows that they're in a different place in 65 than they were in 63 or 61. I think it shows something else. I think the colonization was there as this, you know, panacea for some people. But Lincoln was sort of committed to it. But the most important thing to these people was proving the opposite. That, that as soon as, the, I think what they imagined was that the whites would fall by the wayside because the blacks are the only people who know how to work and they're going to show that once you free uh, blacks in the South, the South is going to rise and you know spring to prosperity and improve. Their, their assumptions are that blacks are going to be there. They're, sh they're not lining ships up with docks at New Orleans to carry them off anywhere. They're not. They're not. It's just not a it's not a major part of their agenda. The major part of their agenda is proving the superior economic vitality of a free labor system. And that's incompatible with colonization. Uh, Monica, you had your hand up. Kalina, we'll take a break in a minute. Uh, yeah, we were talking about, uh, Kalisha brought up Lincoln, and we kind of talked earlier ideas about uh, had the Confederacy won or had there not been a war. I was interested in if you had watched. It's a mockumentary, um, Confederate States of America. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And what, what were your ideas of CSA? I show it sometimes. I watched about half of it. But yes. It's, you know, I'm glad the Confederacy lost. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry it was so hard. It was terrible. I wish it hadn't happened. Would have been a disaster. Those people were. This is what I like about Bruce. Is Bruce Levine. You know, there's another guy who wrote a book. Bruce. Bruce Levine, or The Fall of the House of Dixie. Mm. His argument is basically. It's sort of the flip side of your argument. You know, that the, the, the Southern ruling class is so arrogant and, and so pig headed that it more or less destroys itself. Just refuses to see the handwriting on the wall, and it won't compromise. And it would have been able had they stayed within the Union type slavery forever. You know? If the if the if the Confederate States had succeeded, you know how this how in Brazil in 1870s how the anti-slavery people were talking. You know? They were saying. This is how, this is how we, we now have, know how to get rid of slavery. You surround all the slave states with free states, and you squeeze it together. They're saying what they got from the Americans. Those slaveholders saw the handwriting on the wall. They said, the game is up. We can't do this. Right? We saw what happened in the, North, in the United States. Right? What if the Confederate States had won? seen the handwriting. There was no handwriting for them to see. Mm -hmm. So they were gone forever. They had gone into Mexico. They might have taken Cuba. See what they did. The, it would have been great for them. <laughs> if they wouldn't have to put up with Texas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll just excise that part for the end of the to line get your hand up. Uh, on the Lincoln argument again, like uh, like how precarious was it? You know, like after 1864, 65. I didn't read your book to the end or didn't read that part. Because um, is it as precarious as a movie puts out to be? You know, like if oh, you mean the war ended early, would you know? Oh, well, the war measure could have been rolled back. Don't you think that's so, misleading in the movie? I think that's misleading. I think Lincoln had already said. What Lincoln says in that December 64 ad address is, look, it's, this is going to go. It's just a matter of time. You can do it now, or you or I'll call a special session of Congress and we'll do it now because we've just won this election and we have the votes we need. 
So do it now. The movie makes it look like it was a do or die moment. And if they didn't get it, to, it's a dramatic moment. I mean, the 13th Amendment is a big deal, and it is dramatic, right? But it's not the do or die moment. If they hadn't gotten those votes, Lincoln would have called a special session as soon as Congress went out of session, and they would have had them. You don't think free black folks were in front of the bus? You know, What's that? They wouldn't have been in front of the bus, a la Native Americans, other stuff, of precariousness and the northern ambivalence and stuff like oh, the that. the 13th Amendment? Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know. This war, is where in the era of arena of speculation, why did he? Why did he push so hard in January? I, I think he was worried that if the war ended, some of the steam would go out of it. I think, but I don't know. Yeah. I think you said it before, the chaos of war gives you this incredible legitimacy, and any time you go to a special session, politics being what it is, you could lose it. You don't want to risk it. Right. Right. I think he just didn't want to risk it. I think it was so, also, I, I'm not sure he wanted to risk it. I think it had more to do with the risk of Republicans, it's always tied to the war. If the war is over, it looks like what the Democrats have always been saying is true. It's not really a part of the war. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, he says things like, you know, the reason he vetoes the way Davis built in the summer of '64 is because the way Davis frustrated that the Congress is really fed up with the Democrats that just, who had just destroyed the Thirteenth Amendment. It just went down in the House. And they come back a week later with this day day field, which basically says, no slavery is abolished legislatively. And he vetoes it and says, look, we've been saying forever that Congress can't do this. Like, under the Constitution, we can't do this. We can't go out to the public and say exactly the opposite of what we've been saying about what the Constitution allows. I think that's, that's behind what's going on in 65, or 65. We've always said this is tied to the war. If there's no longer a war, what are we going to say? That's interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll finish up in just a minute. Danielle? Um, we, we started out the seminar and we've talked a lot about the ideal abolitionist. So who is your ideal abolitionist, your ultimate abolitionist? I like most of them. Lately I've liked uh, well this Mm -hmm. Theodore Bright and all that other talk about me. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. I love that freedom of national speech. You know, who can be a real dog? Someone asked earlier. Who? Oh. Uh, so one of our, yeah, the yeah, he, he's, he's kind of a pompous ass, so he's, he's, he's harder to like. Thaddeus Stevens is a lot easier to like. So here's a little game we'll play then. I was gonna go in this direction and, and Danielle's question gets me there. Uh, a couple of years ago we had a teacher in here who said, rather than either or, uh, I, I suppose channeling what you've been saying, she said we should think of the strengths and weaknesses of all abolitionists or anti-slavery figures and maybe put them on a scale or barometer one to a hundred so even someone like Jefferson could register um, and so we've had debates here about a 1 to 100 number for people like Nat Turner, John Brown, Garrison. They're typically in the 80s or 90s. Uh, this is the match game round. Abraham Lincoln, 1 to 100 on the abolition scale. <laughs> Washington, Jefferson, Franklin. Washington's higher than Jefferson. 
Do you think Butler is advocating, Jones, no. or what? is he? Do you think Butler was advocating, or is he just wanted to the answer to come from somebody else? No, uh, this is uh, this is. A, I would have two months ago, uh, a year ago, I would put him higher. But I, I, I no longer think. I'm, I'm, I'm more and more persuaded that military emancipation, that he's the kind he's advocating, is not a particularly radical position. Many would say it's a mainstream position that it, that's there all over the place. So that uh, all he's so he just wants to wipe his hand of responsibility. Wants to come from somebody else, or is he I, kind of pushing? He's a good Jacksonian. I like I like his. Don't see him as he's okay. He's good. I mean, I like what he does. I think he's good. I like him the way he puts it to the slaveholders or just And I like, you know, I like the way he went. Uh, Frederick Douglass. Oh, he's right. Close to the top. Close to the top. Yeah. yeah. Over Lincoln. As on the abolition. Yeah, on the one to one hundred scale, you got Lincoln at a ninety. Last one used to be the center of the abolitionist world, William Lloyd Garrison. Oh, no, 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 no. Did I hear that right? Yeah, I think he's oh. largely irrelevant by the wow. fifties. I, I like him, but I think he's made himself substantially irrelevant. And I'm not saying wow well, because I agree. I'm just saying this gets us back to what I told you before. For scholars, it's that social movement protest that has defined abolition. Yeah. And you're saying it's these policymaker emancipators who have it's been unheralded. Efficacy. It has Ooh, to be making a difference. Wow. That's amazing. The That's 90s. Efficacy. It's not just the, the purity standard. I don't, I don't, the purity standard is of no interest to me. It's, it's not no interest to me. The efficacy standard is at least as important to me. I think the rest of the week's going to be very, very interesting. Real quick, no, no, Ben, no, no. Byron. I, I, I want to just ask you, it seems to me, though, that often uh, the efficacious political maneuverings are kind of following a public discourse. And folks like Garrison are out there creating a public discourse, yeah, making just moderation not just Garrison. increasingly progressive. Yeah, I think that's... That so you could couldn't have... You could make a case like that if you wanted to. I think that's... When Lincoln, <laughs> when Lincoln says, when, when you hear Republicans say, I'm not an abolitionist, I think they have Garrison. I mean, the garrison is useful for them yeah. as a way of distinguishing themselves from the abolitionist movement. But uh, what, I mean, other than rhetorically, I'm not sure what difference that makes. Because I don't think, I don't think he's particularly involved in the construction of an anti-slavery agenda that ultimately forces the issue in 1860. He, he moves to the sidelines and watches that take place in another realm. Not that he's a to it, but and he's fascinated by it, and ultimately, okay. during the war, I mean, he's revolutionized, right? He's moderated, moderatized. Everybody else is radicalized, right? He's he's moderated by the war in the sense that he comes to appreciate efficacy. And I think Douglas does too. You know, comes to appreciate, he comes to appreciate efficacy where it had always been about purity. I admire your critique of kind of the search for pure radicals, but it seems to me that radicalism serves an important social function in shaping discourse that kind of creates space then for right. moderates to... The question to is which radicals? Sure. Who, who you, and you, well, you, what, Douglas, you know, would hear. No, Theodore Drake, well, no, that's why I said okay. him. He's really in that group of radicals that is struggling to formulate I don't think he's come uh, up yet, has he? Political, Theater, quite well. viable, constitutional, anti-slavery politics. Con you know, a politically viable argument for anti-slavery that is within the Constitution, as most Northerners understand. And his, his, he's high up on the purity scale, but he's also high up on the efficacy scale. So, mm -hmm. it's, would you agree? I would, except he except drops he out for 20 out, right? years and <laughs> he drops out, runs right. a school in New Jersey. Right. 
Right. Well, he, he comes back in the war. He does come back. He comes back in the war and he starts giving speeches. Right. Right. And he's really the one who articulates some of the Liberty Party beginnings. Right. And, um, Derek Smith also is, in a sense, moderated by the war also. I mean, the two extremes on the constitutional scale, the, the pro-slavery constitutionalism and the anti-slavery constitutionalism, those people come to the chase position over the course of the war, because it's the most efficacious. It's the one that's going to work. It's the one that's going to work. Ultimately, it has to work. He's giving you a new barometer. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> this is going to make this week very interesting, because look who we have up in the 90s, and you all can disagree or agree, but we have a different calibration now. Efficacy, right? What's going to force the issue? In a way, you could say we had that debate with fugitive slaves, but harangues, protests, purity, those things don't seem to force the issue. And here you have someone yes, saying, you can use the political I, 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 I system to do this. I didn't say that. <laughs> what did you say? I think you just like do force the issue. Yeah, no, no. I, we've I had debates about this. Harangues do force the issue. Okay. What, what, what is the harangue? The power of Congress over Washington, D.C. is the harangue. Right, that gradualists put on the agenda. Freedom National is a home land. It's not a garrison in the North. And it's not a Jared Smith. But it's a harangue. I think harangues do matter. And I think fugitive slaves do matter. But there's an efficacy standard along with the purity standard. And I don't think there is one. I think once you stop purity, the problem is. Efficacy you can measure a lot easier than purity because one guy's purity is another guy's filth. So. <laughs> well, that's a great place to stop. Listen. <laughs>